When you go to a visual effects movie, a movie mm -hmm. that's full of visual effects, can you even enjoy that anymore? Uh, well, when a movie's got very well executed work in it, yeah, absolutely, you can lose yourself and just, uh, you know, part of my, part of my mind is, uh, is thinking, wow, man, that looks like that was hard. Um, but, uh, you know, I can, yeah, I can get lost in the, in the storytelling and enjoy myself. Um, really badly executed work will sometimes pull me out of a picture and, what happened there? God, that was terrible. Uh, uh, I find it very hard to watch things that I worked on. Um, you know, I, I do try and hook up to projects that uh, interest me personally, that I, where I like the director, or I like the subject matter. Um, but uh, you know, the downside of that is then you kind of ruin it for yourself because uh, the, your first impression is gone. Uh, and you know every shop that's in there you've seen a hundred times in all sorts of different states and you know I, the first thing that happens is a flood of memories comes in about yeah boy, I always wish the background was a little darker on that one and you know, that could have been a little better and, I, and you know where you you hid things and uh, and it takes some time before I can go back and look at something that I worked on with any real sense of objectivity. Do you feel like we've lost our ability to suspend our disbelief. Because when, when we were younger and the effects were much mm -hmm. more crude, we, we didn't sit there saying, wow, that could have been done better. You know, we, we sort of, we got lost in that. And just because it was new and it was different, but I feel like to some degree we may have. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, well, perhaps to some extent. I, I think that some filmmakers have gotten lazy that now you can show everything where you, uh, I think some of the best projects used effects more sparingly uh, at, at very deliberate purpose and now it's you know, all about the spectacle. And a lot of films get made only because of spectacle, that they're relatively weak in story and you know it's not particularly rewarding to work on a picture like that. It's just as much work to, to work on a bad movie as it is to work on a good one. But uh, you know, the good ones are <laughs> so much more rewarding because how much people enjoy them. Now you mentioned uh, Photoshop and um, just to briefly talk about that for just a moment, is that you and your brother co-created Photoshop. Yes. Originally called Display, right? The very first version was Display. Right. And from there, you, you began to develop other commercial software, mm -hmm. right? So what was, from, from Photoshop, the, the next thing that you did, what was that? The first one I wrote uh, was a tool for taking height fields and... Uh, so you can paint a height field in Photoshop, check your work, you know, seeing it in 3D, and then exporting that as a actually a 3D model that you could use in a uh, 3D application. And it was a little tool I called CyberMesh. Um, and it, again, it's very small market. It didn't really make sense to build that into the application, but there was a, a small group of uh, diehards that uh, really needed something like that. And, was written to address it. The, the things that I wrote myself, uh, like uh, CyberMesh, and uh, I wrote another uh, exabyte transfer utility called Missing Link, and uh, the, the, of course the lens flare renderers, they all started uh, because it was there to solve a problem that I had actually in production. I wrote CyberMesh because I wanted a tool that, that did, um, could generate the, the 3D models from a height field. Uh, I wrote missing link because I wanted to be able to do 3D work on a desktop and the best way to transfer large files back and forth was with uh, an Exabyte tape drive at the time. There was nothing on the Macintosh that did that. And then uh, the, the lens flare generator um, has kind of an amusing story that uh, that's how it came to be. Uh, it actually got born during uh, Hook uh, Robin Williams, uh, Peter Pan movie. And Eric Brevig was the ILM visual effects supervisor on the, the show. And he was away on plate, and he asked me if I would uh, keep things moving at, uh, at ILM while he was away on plate. So I was sort of supervising in his stead. And uh, in, the, in the film, Tinkerbell uh, flies around in a bunch of shots, and, and when she She's uh, visible as the flying Tinkerbell. She's got a, she's a bright light that casts a lens flare. And Eric had uh, wedged a bunch of lenses, and there was a particular uh, 
50 to 300 millimeter zoom that, that he just really liked the flares from them. Uh, Cause it's this you know, really old piece of, uh, of glass with you know, a thousand elements in it with you know, poor coatings and just made these you know, great patterns. And, um, and we were shooting them um, in, on an animation stand in our effects camera department. And we laid it out on the schedule and, and uh, how long it was taking to shoot each one of the elements. Some of them were a little tricky to, to shoot. Uh, went beyond uh, the, the available time that we had. And so we were looking at, well, should we set up another unit to shoot lens flares? And we, you know, maybe it's day and night crew, because we've only got one of these uh, crazy lenses. Um, and I started looking at the, at the uh, results that we got, uh, the, the images. I was thinking, how hard would it be to write a program that would make this? And so I sat down and started writing uh, what turned into the lens flare generator. And we did about half of the, the flares and then hook with this prototype uh, lens flare generator. And then shortly after that was done, um, Star Trek VI was in-house. And there's the, you know, the opening shot of the movie, there's this, there's this big bright flash and explosion. And uh, our mat department had spent uh, a long time shooting this uh, this beautiful lens flare that's you know, goes whites out the whole frame and then has this very slow ramp and they're actually kind of hard to shoot because the source that can flare out a lens completely so it whites out the whole frame um, is too large to also taper down very nicely and so it was this multiple exposure thing with different sources and it had taken a while to really get the curves just right so it had the right taper. And finally the shot came together and uh, the director looked at it and said, oh, this is really nice, but I don't like this reflection here and this reflection here. Can you get rid of those? And, well, no, you can't because it's just the, the character of the, of the lens. And so Scott, uh, having been familiar with the, the uh, lens flare generator written for Hug, asked, well, could you write a simulator for this lens and copy all the elements except the two that, that the director doesn't like? And so that went in and then did that and that sort of became the, the second uh, lens that was in there was the 105 millimeter. And then uh, there's some other project that came after that where I did the third one and then finally I, I thought um, uh, that it would be fun to build that into a Photoshop plugin. And it, I think it shipped with Photoshop too. Um, uh, let's see, uh, the next project I used it on was uh, Star Trek Generations. We had the uh, there's a short space battle between the Enterprise and this uh, Klingon ship uh, where they're firing photon torpedoes back and forth. And so the uh, I thought, well, the, to really make the, the photon torpedoes uh, look like the, the ones uh, uh, that I liked a lot in the first Star Trek movie, the thing to do would be to, to write a simulator for that. And so I wrote a a uh, couple of primitives that let me do the, the little photon shards. And, uh, and so all the, the photon torpedoes and, and generations were done with this, this tool. And then I started thinking, you know, having these hard-coded lenses in there is, is really a, a very limiting thing. You know, in, in the end, it, these things are all built up out of simple primitives. That's what I'm doing internally. I'm just kind of stacking them together and you know, doing what amounts to an internal composite. Um, really the smart thing to do would be to expose all of that, to, to make uh, uh, parametric primitives that the user could stack and edit, and then if you wanted to get a different effect, I didn't have to go and you know, modify code and recompile. Um, so after generations, I started a, uh, a ground-up rewrite where I wrote this, uh, this sort of uh, primitive-oriented uh, renderer with an editor to let you build them yourself. And the first thing that got used on was uh, Mission Impossible. Uh, I used it for the, uh, the headlight of the, the helicopter, and the, and the helicopter flies in the, the tunnel. And the so you talked about the, the, all these films that, that it was used in the Nola <laughs> Light Factory. I don't think it was called that originally, um, but mm -hmm. that it was used in, um, and over time it evolved because of those, of those films. Mm -hmm. what, what other films has been used in since then? Oh, I, I see it everywhere now. You can hardly watch more than about 10 minutes of television without seeing two or three commercials that, that have it in there. It's used by 
uh, motion graphics designers all the time. Um, we've got the, the core code of the, the LensFlare renderer is, is built into a bunch of ILM tools. And so it, it ends up being used on a lot of the projects that go through ILM. Uh, the Transformers films, uh, the most recent Star Trek film. Uh, we used it on a couple of shots on Avatar as well. Yeah, what, I mean, what do you think it is that makes a, a piece of software that costs a few hundred bucks being used in hundreds of million dollars movies? I mean, what, what about it makes it so good, do you think? Well, it's, it's a, a, a relatively simple tool that it performs an important function. These, uh, uh, massive overexposure generates these, uh, these ref internal reflections that people see as, as lens flares and, and uh, you know, the, the, you don't get them automatically in a computer rendering. This is something that, that ends up being added to, to get higher levels of realism. I think the, the lack of those kinds of, um, those kind of artifacts were something that really stigmatized computer graphics as looking artificial. And, and when the, the first versions of that became available, both the, the Photoshop plugin and uh, uh, Alan Hastings wrote a, uh, a renderer for Lightwave that was a fairly direct copy of, uh, of the lens for renderer that I'd written for Photoshop. Um, as soon as that became available, you started, you know, the artist, as soon as you make it easy to use, they, they'll use it to help you know, give that realism to a lot of shots. And it got horrifically overused to the point where you know, it's uh, you, you'll you'll take a hit if you include one in, in a piece of art. In fact, I I, I was going to talk to you about that. I, I once when I was first starting out, I read a, a top ten things not to do in your reel, mm -hmm. and one of them was to use lens flares. Don't use lens flares in your reel. You're not going to get work. Don't use them unless you know what you're doing. Uh, that's you know, it'd be hard to look at a feature film that doesn't have a lens flare in it somewhere. Either whether it's it's the the, the guard with the flashlight sweeping it across the camera, or the headlights of the car, or the sun, or glints off glass, but uh, they, they're everywhere in, in movies. And you know, there are some directors, you know, Stanley Kubrick, uh, uh, for 2001, wedged some you know, horrific number of lens uh, different lenses to get a particular flare that he liked for, for using on the headlights on the, the pods. Right. We talked about the realism that you that you really like to inject into your work. What in this flare generator? What what have you put into it to really simulate realistic interactions? Well, it, a lot of the premises that are in there came from studying real lens flares uh, in various different films. Um, and for a while, any time uh, we were working on a project where uh, there was uh, a real photographed lens flare in it, uh, I would grab a frame of that and spend some time trying to exactly duplicate that, that flare. And in places where I was having trouble, like, you know, there's really missing a primitive that I need to be able to get that particular look, I would code one up and add it to the flare generator. So what are you hoping to put into the next version of, of uh, No Light Factory? Well, I think it's, it's high time that the, the tool did high dynamic range. So uh, floating point calculation uh, is probably one of the bigger ones. Uh, and as we've been using the tool ourselves, um, we've been finding that uh, to really get the, the flares to look super realistic, there's a lot of pre-processing that gets done. We end up uh, uh, rendering the flares. There's lots of separate elements and combining them with various noises and, uh, and other effects to kind of stack up into something that, that really looks completely real. And I think that the intent is to try and build a lot of those same things that we're kind of doing as elaborate After Effects pre-comps and uh, build them right into the tool so you get it straight out of the render. You use After Effects a lot yourself? I do, yeah. Because you mentioned earlier that you, you, know, you did the warp for the, for the Enterprise. How often do you find yourself actually sitting down and really getting into it and doing that? Uh, not as much as I'd like. Uh, you know, I do occasional little side projects, uh, either freelance things for friends or uh, just hobby projects. And generally, the, the compositor of choice that I, I use is still After Effects, mostly because I'm just really familiar with it, and it does uh, a lot of the things that uh, I want to do. It does them very well. So word on the street is that you're working on some kind of motion control rig for lens flares. Uh, well, a few years back, um, 
back when I was starting on episode two, this is the first uh, big feature film that was shot with digital cameras, uh, it occurred to me that uh, we should be shooting our motion control elements with digital cameras as well. And the first thought was we should try a digital still camera. And for a variety of reasons, uh, it ended up not really working out that way, and we ended up shooting um, the motion control elements with the same HD cameras we shot the rest of the, the movie with. But I got to be enamored of the idea of, of using a uh, sort of prosumer level digital still camera as a motion control system. <clears throat> and in particular, I, you know, I like what real photographed lens flares look like, and I thought that I'd love to shoot uh, real lens flares for one of the upcoming projects. And, uh, finally, in the, the spring of 2005, I, I got all the pieces together. I got, uh, had a, a Canon 20D, and I had an old pan tilt head, motion control pan tilt head, that I'd built back in my motion control days. And uh, I got uh, um, a little two-channel stepper motor driver so I could control that uh, pan tilt head. And I got the developer kit from Canon, because uh, you could hook the, the Canon up uh, to a laptop computer with a USB cable, and you can fire off exposures and control various aspects of the, the camera through it. So I spent a little time writing a piece of software that let me control the, the camera so I could fire off exposures and you know, pan it around. And I built um, a, a flare box, and this is just a, uh, it's uh, four feet deep, 18 inches wide, 18 inches high. It's uh, lined on the inside with black velvet and on the back of it is a white LED and I can control the brightness of that LED um, with a um, uh, pulse width modulator card that I can talk to from the laptop. And so I wrote a little <laughs> little application that would let me pan the, the camera wherever I needed to put the light source wherever it needed to be in frame and then control its uh, brightness. And I used it on uh, Pirates 2. So all the, all the lens flares that you see in Pirates 2 were actually uh, photographed on this, this rig. Uh, and I'm using that rig right now to shoot some high dynamic range lens flares to help me uh, kind of get ground truth for the, the HDR conversion that we're doing to KLF. Now you're talking about using an LED, but do different kinds of light affect the way that that, the kind of flare that would be created? The, the, the biggest difference you see um, with the, the source of the, the light is the color of it and then the size. And so, the, out of the box, the flares that you get from, from the uh, light factory uh, represent a very small source, essentially a point source. Then you get these very sharp, well-defined elements. And uh, the, the larger your light source, the softer they all become. Um, so, that's actually one of the other areas I'm, I'm intending to take the, the product, is to do uh, a better simulation of areas. You, you worked on Avatar, which is, visual effects speaking, is probably the best film ever made. So after you do something like that, you work on a film that's that fantastic. Are you done? Like, what, what's next? Like, what, do you, what motivates you to work on a project that comes your way? Well, I look for new challenges, things that uh, are visually exciting or uh, they're... Uh, sometimes it's relationships, it's you know, working with uh, a director that you like because you enjoy the process. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things I, I've always loved about visual effects is that it's almost never the same thing twice. You have new challenges all the time and uh, it's, uh, it's always kind of a fun exploration process. With the, the ease of creating visual effects on really on a consumer level computer, you, you really can do a lot with that. How do you, what do you see the future of practical effects, stuff done on set? I think the, the best films are a good mixture of the two. I mean, I've always uh, had good relationships with the special effects department on films. And you know, if, you, if you're not too precious about who does what, you can be smart about having the right balance. You know, where it's, it's best to do something practically and, and where that hands off well to to visual effects. You know, if you try and go all, all uh, CG, it often looks like that's what you did. Here's a question that I know the people watching really, really want to know the answer to. Uh, people want to know what it takes to work and to get into, to, uh, to work at a company like ILM. What are the kinds of things that, that you look for in your team members? 
talent. That, that's that's really that's a that's a it's a simple answer, but it's really the bottom line. Uh, companies like ILM, the, the only thing they're really going to care about is what can you do, and the best way to develop your talents is to to make images, get out there and, and do something. Well, I really appreciate your taking the time Certainly. to talk. It's been it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure it was as, as exciting for you as it was for me. You don't have to say anything. I know it. it's uh, a <laughs> it's all right. But uh, thank you so much for coming out and sure. uh, for doing that. You bet.